Welcome to the Forum on Indicators of Racial and Religious Harmony, jointly organized by the Institute of Policy Studies and OnePeople.sg. My name is Mohammed Hamsha, and I will be the MC for this event. Before we begin, uh, please check that your mobile phones and electronic devices are switched on to the silent mode, so as not to interrupt the proceedings. To help us prepare for the next event, please do complete the evaluation form found in your brochure and pass them to our colleagues at the end. It is now my pleasure to invite Mr. Janaras Devan, Director of the Institute of Policy Studies, to give the opening remarks. Mr. Devan, please. Thank you everyone for making the time to come this morning for this uh, workshop. Uh, or conference on the survey that IPS jointly conducted with OnePeople.sg. Let me tell you a little about what the survey was about and why we conducted it before I make some general remarks about the import of its findings. Why, what is the survey about? It is actually a very broad survey that measures Singaporeans' attitudes on race, language and religion. Such a survey has never been conducted before. And it is a very large survey. We interviewed, we, we surveyed about 5,000 people and we got about 3,000 random uh, responses. In addition to the 3,000 responses, we did two booster samples, 500 or so each of Malays and Indians so that we have a sufficient number of minorities to be able to make an accurate reading of minority attitudes. So a survey of 4,000 covering a whole gamut of, of, um, of things from race, language to religion. Why? Because we wanted to establish a benchmark after almost 50 years of independence as to the state of interracial, interreligious and interlinguistic or intralinguistic relations among Singaporeans. OnePeople.sg came in and asked us to create a set of indicators of harmony, which will then become serve as a benchmark for the future. You, this is what we have today. We actually have actually only one part of this massive survey, the indicators that we have derived from that survey, which will now serve as a benchmark going forward in the future years. When we do a similar survey, we can refer to this benchmark to see how much progress we have made or, or as the case may be, uh, um, where the problems might lie. So that's the reason why we have done this, um, and, uh, and I think um, it is useful that we have done this. I would like to make a few brief uh, remarks to set the stage as far as I can for the discussions uh, that you'll have, that you'll hear. Uh, first, uh, Matthew will present the survey findings, followed by which uh, we will have a panel discussion with a few very distinguished Singaporeans who have um, uh, looked long and hard at the problems of creating a multiracial multi-religious, multi-linguistic Singapore. This year, 19, 2013, in fact next Monday, September 16th, is a very significant date. It is not only MM's 90th birthday, it is also Malaysia's 50th anniversary. There are a number of strange things about this day. I bet nobody here is conscious that actually September 16, 2013 is Singapore's 50th anniversary of Singapore's existence as an independent country. Because it was on September 16, 1963 that we became finally independent of British colonial rule when we became a part of independent sovereign Malaysia. But we don't, we can't, we won't commemorate that day as such. We actually have a recording, a televised recording of Mr. Lee Kuan News on the steps of the Padang saying, we shall forever be independent on this day, September, 13, September 16, 1963. We actually don't have a recording of him saying, we shall forever be an independent sovereign state on August 9, 1965. That was just a printed uh, proclamation. So, but the Malaysians, they themselves aren't preparing, it looks like, to celebrate September 16, 2013 
in as big a way as they celebrated in, 19, in 2007, the 50th anniversary of the founding of Malaya. For them too, and they treated that, the 50th anniversary of the founding of the independent Malaya, as actually the 50th anniversary of Malaysia. They say 50th anniversary of Malaysia, but actually it wasn't. It was actually only the 50th anniversary of Malaya. For them, independent Malaya, the founding of independent Malaya on August 30th, I think, 1957, is more important than the founding of Malaysia in 1963, when Sabah, Sarawak and Singapore joined Malaya to form Malaysia. Why, why is that significant for us? Malaya excluded Singapore. It was deliberate. It was a political act. In fact, after the war, uh, I, know, I don't know how many of you know this, but actually since Singapore's founding in 1819 as a, as a British uh, colony, uh, it was most of the time ruled as part of what was called Straits Settlement, together with Mal Malacca and Penang. And then the, the Malay states were Malay federated states. They, the, the sultans were nominally uh, sovereign and uh, the British were, were advisors. So, in, in, in the British had all kinds of gradations of colonial contraptions. Um, and so Singapore was a colony, but whereas Johor wasn't a colony. Uh, but anyway, um, after the war, the British came back and they proposed the creation of a Malayan Union. In other words, they would rule Singapore together with Malaya as one entity. And there was a huge ruckus. There was huge protest. Because a united Malaya as one entity would mean the Malays would no longer be a majority. If you include the Chinese in Singapore as part of Malaya, Malaya would no longer be Malay. And as a result, the Malays organized themselves. It was actually the birth of UMNO. UMNO was created in protest of the Malayan Union. And that is how Singapore was kept out of Malaya and continued to be ruled as a separate crown colony after the war. So all this has got implications for race and religion even up to today. History, there's a character in, in James Joyce's Ulysses who says, history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awake. Reading the survey results, the thing that occurs at the topmost of my mind is that it is, provides evidence that we actually have awakened or awoken from the nightmare that is history. If Mr. Rajaratnam was still alive and he were reading the survey, I think he'd be very happy. Because what is clear is there is formal acceptance of the words in the pledge. We pledge ourselves as one united people regardless of race, language, or religion. You look at the survey findings, you'll find that overwhelming majority of Singaporeans accept that it is a good that Singapore is in fact diverse. An overwhelming majority of Singapore, Singaporeans are ideologically committed to the idea of Singapore being a multiracial society. If you had told me 30 years ago, or when I was in school, 40 years ago, that we would have achieved so soon a sense of a Singapore identity, I would, be, would have been surprised. And actually, I am surprised. The extent to which we have, in fact, achieved a Singapore identity. And that is the good news. But I think you would also see in the survey grounds for what I would call caution you do find a formal acceptance of the idea of a multiracial Singapore. You do find, and this is incredible, people, as, as Matthew will, will detail in a little while, people do not, people of all races do not perceive any discrimination when they appear at public spaces, you know, public counters, either in hospitals or schools or the police. I mean, this is just incredible when you look at, you know, what's happening in other countries. It's, it's, it, so there is a... a a conscious acceptance that the public space is, in fact, beyond race. 
and it's an amazing achievement. But there is room for caution. If you look, say, at the findings of how many people have friends across the races, uh, it is not all that high. Right? Um, I, I was remarking to my friends earlier that the, the, the most friendly race appears to be Eurasians. They have lots of friends across the, the races. Um, next uh, will be Indians and Malays, and, and then last, Chinese. And perhaps this is not surprising, given that you know, the Chinese are uh, an overwhelming majority. Um, but these are grounds for concern. Um, I think um, the survey findings give us room for optimism. Um, I'm surprised myself. I would have been surprised 30 years ago if you had told me we would have a survey finding that, that actually says, that, that suggests very strongly that the words of the pledge have in fact been fulfilled to a, in, not in full measure, but very substantially. Uh, but I think it also underlines that we have to keep working at this. History is a nightmare from which we have awoken but I think, I think we need to remember that nightmares can recur, uh, and they have recurred, and that uh, we have to exercise great caution and great consciousness in order to avoid such an eventuality. So on that note, uh, let me um, invite Matthew to present the survey findings, uh, and then followed by uh, a panel discussion. Thank you very much.